Now, we'll revisit some proofs from neutral geometry, but we'll carry these proofs out on a model of hyperbolic geometry, the Poincaré disk model. First, we'll revisit the construction of an equilateral triangle. Given a segment AB, construct an equilateral triangle on that segment. Well, first we'll construct a circle centered at A with radius AB, and then we'll construct a circle centered at B with radius BA. Where those two circles intersect, we'll call that point C, and connect the point C to the points A and B. CA is equal to BA, since they're both radii of circle centered at A. Similarly, AB and CB are both equal because they're radii of circle centered at B. Therefore, all sides of this triangle are equal. By transitivity, it is an equilateral triangle. Next, we'll revisit the angle bisector construction. So, given an angle, CAB, with vertex at A, first, we'll choose an arbitrary point D on the line segment AB, and then draw a circle through the point D, a circle centered at A with radius AD. The point of intersection of the circle and the ray AC, we'll call that point E. We'll draw a line segment connecting the points D and E, and then construct an equilateral triangle which has DE as one of its sides. This new point F will connect the point A and the point F with a ray, and it turns out that this line is our bisector of the angle. To see why, Recall that AE and AD are both radii of a circle and both equal. Side DF and EF are both sides of an equilateral triangle and thus equal. And side AF is equal to itself. Therefore, we have two congruent triangles, AFE and AFD. They're congruent by side, side, side. Therefore, since corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, Angle EAF is equal to angle DAF. Therefore, AF is truly the bisector of the angle at A. Next, we'll revisit the segment bisector proof. First, given the segment AB, we'll construct an equilateral triangle that has AB as one of its sides. We'll call that third vertex C. Then, we'll bisect the angle at C and that point of intersection, we'll call it D. Now, once again, we have two congruent triangles. Triangles ADC and BDC are congruent by side angle side. AC is congruent to BC because they're two sides of an equilateral triangle. Angle ACD and BCD are congruent because CD is the angle bisector. And finally, these two triangles share the side CD, which is congruent to itself. Therefore, these two triangles are congruent, and since corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, the segment AD must be equal to the segment BD. Thus, D bisects the segment AB. Next, we'll revisit the perpendicular construction Specifically, given a line AB and a point C not on that line, construct a perpendicular to AB that passes through the point C. First, we'll choose any point D on the side opposite C on the line AB, and we'll draw a circle centered at C, which passes through this point D. Then, where this circle intersects the line AB, We'll call those two points E and F. We'll connect C to these points E and F. Therefore, CE and CF are equal, radii of the circle. And we'll draw the segment EF and construct the midpoint G of that segment. Finally, we'll connect the points C and G with a line, and we claim that this line is perpendicular to AB. To see why, we notice that we have two congruent triangles by side, side, side. CE and CF are congruent, being sides of an equilateral triangle. GE and GF are congruent, because G is the midpoint of EF. And GC is equal to itself. Therefore, these two triangles are congruent. Corresponding parts are congruent. 
So the angle CGE is equal to the angle CGF. But these two angles together make a straight line, therefore these two angles must be right angles, meaning this line we constructed, CG, is in fact perpendicular to AB. We'll do another perpendicular construction, this time given a line AB and a point C that is on the line AB, construct the perpendicular which passes through this point. First, we'll choose another point D on this line, and then draw the circle centered at C with radius CD. The second point of intersection of the circle with the line AB, we'll call that point E. Next, we'll construct an equilateral triangle which has DE as one of its sides. We'll call that third vertex F. And then we'll construct the line through the points C and F, and we claim that this line is perpendicular to the original line AB. To see why, we notice that again we have two congruent triangles, FCE and FCD. They're congruent by side, side, side. FE and FD are two sides of an equilateral triangle, so they're equal. CE and CD are radii of a circle and therefore equal. And these two triangles share the common side CF, which is equal to itself. Therefore, these two triangles are congruent. The corresponding parts are congruent. In other words, these two base angles at C are equal, which means that they're right angles. So this line, CF, is perpendicular to the original line AB. Create the line parallel to a line AB that passes through a point C. First, construct a perpendicular to the line AB that passes through the point C. We'll call the point of intersection D, and we'll choose another point on that line, call it E, and then we'll construct another perpendicular. The perpendicular to DE that passes through the point C. Now because these lines are perpendicular to each other, we have a right angle at CDB, and in this alternate interior position, we have another right angle. So by Euclid's Proposition 27, which also holds in neutral geometry, since the alternate interior angles are equal, these two lines must be parallel. And this gives us a set of parallel lines. Now one of the interesting things in hyperbolic geometry is that for a given line and a point not on that line, there's actually infinitely many parallel lines to AB passing through this point C. To see where the rest of these lines come from, we're going to look at Euclid's proof of the construction of parallel lines, which is slightly longer than the double perpendicular construction, but generalizes very nicely to give us the remaining parallel lines. To do this, we'll need another construction from neutral geometry. Here we'll review the length transfer construction. Given a segment AB, and a line CD, we'd like to construct a segment starting at C that lies on the line CD that has the same length as AB. This is Euclid's propositions 2 and 3. First, we'll connect A, one of the endpoints of the segment, to the point C, and construct an equilateral triangle that has AC as one of its sides. Call this third vertex E. Next, We'll extend these two sides, EA and EC, and make them rays that originate at the point E. And we'll draw a circle centered at A, whose radius is AB. The intersection of this circle with a ray EA, we'll call that point of intersection F. And AF and AB, both being radii of the circle centered at A, must therefore be equal. Next, we'll construct a circle centered at E whose radius is EF. Where this purple circle intersects the ray EC, we'll call that point of intersection G. Now, since EF and EG are both radii of the same circle, they must be equal. But equals subtracted from equals yield equals. In other words, EF is composed of EA and AF, 
EG is composed of EC and CG. Since EC is equal to EA, the remaining parts, that is AF and CG, must also be equal. Next, we'll draw a circle centered at C with radius CG. And where this circle intersects the line CD, we'll mark that point as H. And finally, we mark the segment CH. CH is a radius of the circle centered at C, as is CG. So CH and CG have the same length, but CG has the same length as AF, which in turn has the same length as AB. Therefore, by transitivity, AB and CH have the same length. And that completes the proof of length transfer. With this result in hand, we're ready to revisit the parallel line construction. So given a line segment, so given a line, a, B, and a point C not on that line, we'd like to construct a line parallel to A, B that passes through the point C. This time, rather than using the double perpendicular construction, we'll proceed more along the lines of Euclid's construction. First, we'll choose a point D on the line A, B. And note that this point D can be chosen to be anywhere on this line. We'll connect C to D and draw a circle centered at D with radius DC. Where that line intersects AB, we'll call one of those points of intersection E, and we'll connect E to C. We'll draw a circle centered at C whose radius is CD. Next, we'll draw the segment EC, and then draw a circle centered at D whose radius is EC. We know we can do this by length transfer. Now, where these two circles intersect, the circle centered at C and the circle centered at D, we'll mark that point as F, and then connect F to D and connect F to C. Now, FC is equal to CD, which in turn is equal to DE, since they're all radii of these red circles. Similarly, FD is equal to CE. So we have two congruent triangles by side, side, side. Triangle EDC is congruent to triangle FCD. Because these two triangles are congruent, corresponding parts are also congruent. In particular, angle FCD, this angle here, is congruent to angle CDE. If we extend the segment FC into a line, this line through F and C is parallel to the line through A and B. This follows from Euclid's Proposition 27, the Alternate Interior Angles Theorem. But now recall that this construction all depends on the arbitrary choice of the position of this point D. In particular, if we move this point D that will also shift the position of the line FC. As long as D is any point on this line, each point will produce a new parallel line, FC. In particular, we can trace out all the different positions that this line can have for this point D. As D moves back and forth, we get many parallel lines to the original line AB. Notice that none of these lines that's being traced out actually intersects AB. And thus, we have infinitely many parallel lines through this point C to the original given line AB. Playfair's axiom is false in hyperbolic geometry.